I'm deeply honored to be here with you today at this commencement. Should probably be a little more nerve wracking having to live up to the expectation of sending graduates off with some dose of profound wisdom. But the fact is it's actually quite liberating. I have been in your place and I know that you're not listening to a word I'm saying. <laughs> so with that in mind, let me tell you something somewhat scary. This week, I asked a friend if he had any advice or words of wisdom that he thought I should share with you. This is an incredibly smart and accomplished man, happily married, three children, wonderful children. He's a faithful Catholic with a very successful corporate career, an abundance of hobbies and community interests. And he told me to make sure that you know that 25% of your life on Earth is already over. <laughs> and let me tell you, just hearing that made me panic on your behalf. I mean, I was, this is, here they're thinking they're just getting going only to find out that you're already one quarter done. And that's really a best case scenario, if we're being honest. It's like, if God grants you a long life, that's what, that's what we're talking about. Most people your age don't really wrestle with this reality, which is actually both frightening and comforting. There's this view that we hear a lot these days that leaving college means you're entering the real world. You will now, of course, take on more responsibilities, paying bills, getting jobs, starting a family. But the fact is that you're already in the real world and you've already spent a significant portion of your life in the real world. You've experienced some of life's highs and lows. You've struggled with coursework and with dating. You've witnessed and rejoiced over births among your family and friends, and you've mourned and buried your dead. You've experienced great joy, betrayal, and loneliness. You already know what the real world is. Now, some of you probably really have your act together as you prepare to walk out of here. You're getting your degree, you have your job lined up, you know how your career is gonna work out for you. Maybe you've already found your spouse or you soon will. And others of you might be more like me. Your focus on, your focus of study might have been a bit off. I majored in economics, which was totally awesome, but not what I ended up going into. You aren't really sure what you're going to do to make money. You haven't found a spouse, and you might be totally clueless about how you even go about finding a spouse. I did not get married until 32, so let that, uh, you, you know what I was dealing with. The world will say to people like this, you need to find yourself and will encourage you to spend your post-collegiate time doing so. And some people in the church might even say that you need to find your vocation. But here's where the real Christian understanding of vocation is so key. In a Christian understanding, vocation is not our career, or at the very least, it's certainly not just our career. And yes, I heard that the whole point of Kings is to transform society by preparing students for careers in which you shape and lead key and public private institutions. And don't mess that up because people have put a lot of time and effort into that, so <laughs> I'll discourage that. But vocation is really plural, not singular. We have vocations. These are all of our stations in life that enable us to help our families, strengthen our communities, and serve our neighbors. God works through each of our many vocations to provide for all of us. When we ask God to give us this day our daily bread, he provides our daily needs through the vocations of countless people, from farmer to professor to dry cleaner, from family members to congregational members and friend. Through these relationships, we are able to tend to the emotional and physical needs of those closest to us. And that's true no matter what stage of life you're in, young or old, happily single, unhappily single, married or widowed, daughter, uncle, missionary, CEO. Of course, it's also through these relationships that we also inflict pain and suffering. We are sinners. We break each and every one of the commandments. We gossip. We take shortcuts. We fail to honor each other sexually. We fail to show the love of Christ to our neighbors who look or act different than us. We harbor hatred in our hearts toward our fellow man when we are slighted. And we are ungrateful in all the ways it's possible to be ungrateful. 
The other day, one of my children made a mistake and was calling herself an idiot, which is not acceptable in our household. In the process of instructing our daughter not to denigrate herself, my husband pointed out to her that the word comes from the Greek idios, which means private or something unique to a particular person. It's the same root where we get seemingly unrelated words, such as idiosyncratic or idiom. His point was that the real definition of the word is not someone who's dumb or foolish, and we know that Jesus tells us not to call our brothers or ourselves foolish. It's a person who doesn't think about serving others. Based on your accomplishments here today, I am certain that you are very smart people. But if you miss the point of having a properly prioritized understanding of vocation, you will not be wise. The great evangelist and reformer Martin Luther said of how we should live vocationally, we conclude therefore that a Christian lives not in himself, but in Christ and the neighbor. He lives in Christ through faith and in his neighbor through love. Okay, now that I've scared you about how your life will be over before you know it, and your vocational responsibilities will weigh heavily on you, I also would like to tell you something that I hope is somewhat comforting, which is don't be afraid. Old people, like myself, sometimes say that their younger cohorts are irresponsible and lack a sense of duty. But I think many young people have the exact opposite problem, especially those of you that are highly organized achievers. You're so risk averse and so cautious that it actually keeps you from enjoying some aspects of the life that God has given you. Life is beauty, beautiful and messy and unpredictable. And sooner or later, something is going to come along. Maybe it's a tragedy that forces you to completely reassess your life. Or maybe it's a fantastic career opportunity that comes completely out of the blue and you've got less than a week to decide whether you want to move to Singapore or not. Maybe it's leaping into the permanent commitment of marriage, marriage where you'll be united with one person. Being too risk averse can come into conflict with your Christian ideals. There's this woman, Tristan Bloom, who is a writer I admire, who is also a professional chef. But before she figured a bit about her career path, she got kicked out of Yale. She came to see the setbacks she experienced, not just as a teachable moment, but key to a big part of her Christian worldview once she realized that her life was not over as a result of certain choices she had made. Specifically, she ended up returning to Yale for a pro-life conference and delivered a stunning speech on why her own mistakes reaffirmed why she was pro-life. She was speaking at this conference, and so she was talking in the context of how having a child might be one of the riskiest things you, you could do. She wrote about how this aversion to risk that a lot of us have is a key ingredient in the culture of death. She said, I think that we are pathologically terrified of risk, and I think that we have this enslavement to our own ideas of respectability, our own ideas of our life plan, our commitments, our existing duties, such that something as radically changing as a new life doesn't fit in with those existing duties. To accept that life would be the irresponsible choice, you know, some people say. And that's the framework from which a lot of people are operating. They see themselves as accepting consequences, as responsible. They have a semblance of a moral framework, and we can't ignore that just because it's completely the opposite of our own. And this isn't just about whether or not you accept a child. I think that we are so enslaved to a plan and a routine and a vision of our lives, we can't embrace the unsettledness, openness, flexibility, and folly that it takes to have an actually pro-life culture in every instance. We have this idea that the word risk is inherently bad. If someone is risky, that is a bad person, which makes absolutely no sense because certainly Christians are not people who live their lives avoiding risk. They are not the responsible, safe people who are doing sensible things. The best Christians look like madmen in many senses. I think that a similar thing here is conditioning ourselves to be welcoming of risk and welcoming of interruptions to our plans and not taking our plans very seriously to begin with. This can obviously be taken to stupid extremes, which is why this isn't really a system, but sort of an attitude adjustment. When we talk about a pro-life culture, I actually think in some ways that does mean a pro-risk, pro-flexibility culture. So thank you for letting me read that extended quote because I love it so much. These are incredibly wise words coming from someone who was your age when she made them, made these remarks. 
Nearly all of the big decisions in life, and even many of the things that come your way that aren't really decisions of yours, come with significant risk attached. The biggest people, the biggest mistake people make in life is often not that they make the wrong decisions, it's that they make no decisions. They put off making decisions out of fear, and a life full of small abdications in the face of pivotal moments always adds up to grand personal failure. Let's get on out there, grab the world by the horns, take risks, and choose life. And I don't just mean go out there and have a lot of kids, although you should totally have a lot of kids because they're wonderful. If God gives them to you, be very happy about it. But I also just mean choose life at every opportunity and in the grandest sense possible. So at this point, I think I've given you a bit of a paradox. On the one hand, the life of the Christian means a tremendous amount of responsibility as lived out in your vocations and how you have to juggle a lot of these complicated and difficult and even conflicting responsibilities. On the other, I'm telling you don't be afraid and take risks. So how exactly do you go through life without being overwhelmed all the time? Obviously, trusting in God, receiving forgiveness when you mess up, and you will when you sin. But I'm now old enough that I can also confidently tell you that there is one thing that helps a great deal, learning to be grateful. The problem is that this is much easier said than done. We are hardwired to be sinful and selfish, and it is difficult even for the most pious among us to remain grateful. It is especially difficult for people your age who take basic miracles, such as good health, for granted. The best way to become grateful is to practice gratitude as a spiritual discipline. Incorporate your thanks into your daily prayers. When faced with adversity, force yourself to thank God for what he has given you. Just as you have to condition yourself to take risks, you have to condition yourself to be grateful. And once you begin to make the effort, it's usually not hard to at least remind yourself that things could always be worse. And in fact, probably were much worse for many of our brothers and sisters in Christ throughout history. You, know, you don't like going to the dentist. Just imagine what dentistry was like 100 years ago before they developed Novocaine. Just an example. Never forget your cup overflows. That same psalm, which tells us this, tells us that the Lord prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. The means by which our faith is strengthened, by which we are empowered to forgive one another, and to be grateful for what God has done for us, is at that table. The single most important thing you can do is not really your work at all. It is God's work where he gives us his gifts of word and sacrament given for our benefit, his real body and real blood shed for you. In this real world that you have spent your lives in and will continue to spend your lives in, this is a great gift. Jesus came to be with you in this world, to take on your sin and crush it, to take death and destroy it, and to give us new life which has already begun in him. So enjoy your vocations, enjoy taking risks in his name, and give thanks to God for all he has done for you. Congratulations on your achievement, and I look forward to seeing what's in store for you. Thank you.